So good morning, uh, folks. This is the Senate Agricultural Committee and uh, Friday, January 26. Um, we have on the agenda this morning uh, uh, Rosie Cougar and Anna Anora Horton. Um, we're going to get a report uh, from our uh, in regards to our a meals program in the school. We also have with us uh, several people from the Northeast Kingdom Collaborative who uh, it's all virtual uh, today, this morning, from uh, 9 and 10.30. And we have a few people um, that will be uh, meeting at Canada when we finish with uh, and Laura and, and uh, Rosie, uh, that you all know, may have some questions for us in regards to whatever. And uh, so um, we'll, uh, I guess we'll start off with you, Rosie. We'll introduce ourselves uh, and then we'll uh, get a report from you, uh, General, you know, how it's going. And, federal program, how that's working out, uh, how, how it's working out, uh, good or bad for our children, and go from there. Brian, so, yep, Brian Collimore, representing the Rutland District. Uh, Brian Campion, Bennington District. Uh, Rich Westman, Royal District. And uh, I'm Bobby Starr from Orleans District. And Irene Renner is... Uh, from the Milton Burlington Chittenden North. Chittenden North District, and she'll she'll be she's meeting with some students from I believe St Albans School right now, but she'll be uh, joining us uh, in a few minutes. So anyway, welcome uh, Rosie, and it's good to have you with us, and and we'll turn it over to you. It's good to see you all. Um, for the record, I'm Rosie Kruger. I'm the State Director of Child Nutrition Programs at the Agency of Education. Um, so I thought I would start today by telling you about um, how the Universal School Meals uh, Act implementation is going. Um, Senator Campion has heard this a little bit already. I was in Senate Education um, a couple weeks ago speaking about that. Um, so a little, a little bit of a repeat for him, but um, we'll start there. Um, and then um, I can tell you about some recent updates from USDA um, that have um, impacted that implementation in a positive way. Um, I have a lot of good news for you today. Um, and then from there, um, I'm happy to answer whatever questions you have. Um, we could talk a little bit about the local foods incentive as well and how that's going. Um, so that's what I plan to talk about today, but I'm, I know you generally just wanted to hear about school food programs, so I'm also happy to, to answer any general questions that you've got. Yeah, you can emphasize and expand the uh, good side of things. Uh, <laughs> We get a lot of bad news, so any good news is very welcome. Yeah, so um, I can tell you, you know, you all were very deliberate in Act 64 um, and in its predecessor, the, the one-year pilot bill on universal meals. Um, and you really worked with us closely um, on getting the details of both those bills right. Um, and I just um, want to say that I really appreciate that because that means that this year's um, implementation of the permanent universal school meals, meals legislation has gone really smoothly. Um, and so by doing it in kind of a, a slow, deliberate fashion with a one-year pilot where we were able to see how it was going and come back to you um, with some suggestions for technical changes that would make things run more smoothly, um, and then you know you all listening to that feedback um, and making those changes, um, the actual implementation this year has, has gone extremely smoothly. Um, and so really happy to be able to report that back to you. Um, and I will say that I am on an, an email chain with some state directors in other states that have been implementing these policies where their legislatures kind of looked at the big picture but didn't necessarily work with them directly on the details and things are not going as smoothly in those states. So um, just wanna give you all some, some good feedback for, for taking that really deliberative approach um, on, uh, <laughs> on that um, implementation. 
Um, so overall, um, participation in the school meals programs is up slightly this year from last year. As you remember, last year was that pilot year of universal meals, um, but we were still dealing with a lot of school closures that fall um, due to COVID and other respiratory illnesses. Um, so we weren't sure how that was going to impact, you know, participation on an ongoing rate. Um, so our part participation rates are up um, by a couple percentage points this year. Um, you know, I think we'll keep an eye on that over the next several years and see if we have a general upward trend or if, you know, this year is sort of a leveling out year and, and we've gotten to, to where we're going to be. Um, our um, final costs for school year 22-23 um, were a little bit low or were quite a bit lower than we had appropriated or you had appropriated. Um, you had appropriated $29 million originally, um, and that was based on a, kind of a midpoint in our um, conservative estimates about what would happen if um, no children, no households returned school meals applications and all students started participating, or you know, what if the same number on the low end, what if the same number of children participated as previously um, and um, the same number of households returned applications um, as uh, as had previously when meals were being charged for. And what we found was that some families returned applications last year, um, not as many as when meals were being charged for, but we did still have some folks returning applications. And that was in part because we did a really big statewide push to get folks to return applications last year. Um, so that helped bring the costs down. Um, and then we found um, that participation went up some last year. Um, as of this year, um, I think this school year, 23, 24, we're seeing like a 25% increase over where we were in school year 2019 when um, we were last charging for meals. So um, there's definitely been an increase, but it's not every child eating every day. Um, Say 20, 25% over the year 19? Over school year 19, October 2019, um, if you compare um, compare that. I want to. I'm still kind of um, refining some numbers there before I give you that estimate officially, but that's that's kind of approximately what we're seeing. So a significant increase for sure, um, but we're not seeing every child eat every day, um, which we thought was possible. You know, the meals are free. You know, the, if the policy worked super well, um, we might see see a huge increase in participation. Um, I think we've seen a significant increase, um, but it's not. There are still um, a lot of students who are, you know, bringing a meal from home and that kind of thing, which is which is fine. We just weren't sure what number to pick in there. Um, the other reason that costs were a little lower last year than anticipated um, is that um, when we did our mid-year estimates for you in January, um, we didn't yet have numbers. So in January last year, we said it might cost about twenty-seven million instead of twenty-nine million. And in fact, our numbers came in, um, the final cost was about 24.5 million for the meals we served last year. Um, and a lot of that was due to um, free and reduced students continuing to participate at a higher rate than paid students. Um, we weren't sure what was going to happen. And so we assumed that all students in all categories would participate in the same rate. But um, in actuality, free and reduced students participated at a higher rate, which allowed those costs to um, to come down even more. Um, uh, so, yeah. Uh, what what happens to that uh, 5.5 million in between what we appropriated and and what it actually cost? Just yeah. So I I've just been um, talking with some folks um, just this week to try and figure out. Um, the answer to that. And it sounds like we do need to do a reversion of those funds. Um, so we'll be working on that um, to do that formally for you all um, so that those can be incorporated back into the education fund. Um, by, the, by the looks of things that revert, that'll be good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'll certainly be helpful. Um, and then when we look um, at school year 23, 24, um, we had estimated this fall that we might come in at 26.5 million for this year. At this point, our estimates are actually even lower than that. Um, and I think we'll be presenting a, a new estimate um, either 
later today or um, or early next week um, to potentially be included in the um, Budget Adjustment Act. Um, the reason that costs are lower this year um, it, than the original estimates is because of a bunch of changes made at the federal level. Um, so I'm going to start talking about those um, because those are really good news for Vermont um, going forward um, and, and I've already had some really positive impacts for this year. So first of all, you might remember us talking last year about how um, the Agency of Education and the Department of Vermont Health Access um, had applied to participate in USDA's direct certification through Medicaid pilot. And we were approved to participate in that and um, over the last year worked really hard to get that set up and started um, actually sharing that information with schools um, in August. So that means that um, we're able to get the information about all the kids participating, all the kids who live in households participating in Medicaid, who have a household income under 130% of the federal poverty level and under 185% of the federal poverty level. And um, that allows us to give that information to the schools and the schools to directly certify those children for free and reduced price meals without having to get applications from families. And because we have a really high Medicaid uptake in Vermont, that program has been extremely successful. Um, we were making a few predictions about that last year for you. Um, and we've seen that those, those um, hopeful predictions have come true. Um, and so it looks like we're, we're basically effectively able to replace all of those applications that we used to get um, with direct cert through Medicaid information. So we didn't make a big push on households to return applications this year because we had all that Medicaid data and we really didn't need them to return the applications um, nearly as much as we had in the past. Um, how, how long, Rosie, will that, those, uh things hold? Is this an annual thing or five it's, year? It's yeah. basically a permanent pilot. <laughs> um, so once we're in, we're able to just continue using it. Um, USDA, it's not a, a nationwide thing. States have to apply to participate in it. Um, so not all states participate in it. Um, but now that we're in, um, you know, it, it's basically good until, until Congress or USDA um, changes anything at the federal level, but it's not anticipated that they would. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so now we've got that whole process set up. So we're sharing that information with schools on a monthly basis. Um, one thing that does make this year better um, in terms of having higher numbers of students directly certified through Medicaid is that um, the information was shared starting in August. And once a child becomes directly certified, um, they're directly certified through the entire school year. And I know that Diva was expecting to see um, over the course of this year as they had to start um, doing verification for Medicaid, um, they were expecting to see some households start dropping off of that. And so our numbers may be higher this year than they are next year, um, but that um, that is mitigated by the fact that we're able to use those numbers from this year to get schools participating in the community eligibility provision. And that um, once you're in a, a CEP cycle, um, that is good for four years. So it's possible five years from now, um, our Medicaid direct cert rates will be a little bit lower because maybe fewer families will be participating in um, Medicaid at those at those um, income levels um, in in that year, and that might cause things to um, be uh, our numbers to be a little bit lower. But that's looking so far out at this point that I'm I'm not sure we could really make a prediction about that. Um, so for the for the next several years, um, we'll be able to use these really advantageous numbers from this year. Um, and that is in part because USDA also made a federal rule change um, regarding the community eligibility provision. So you might remember that this is one of the two universal meals options that are available. Um, one is the community eligibility provision and the other is provision two. And the community eligibility provision is the um, more advantageous option. That's um, when you take the number of students who are directly certified and you multiply that by 1.6 and that gives you your free claiming rate and then the rest of the meals are claimed at the paid rate. 
there's less paperwork in this option, and that 1.6 multiplier generally means it is more advantageous um, to the school and that we're drawing down more federal money than we would be um, if it was just based on um, applications, in, as it is in provision two. Um, well, do you have uh, any um, student count numbers? Um, you know, are we beating 60% or 85% or how? Um, yeah, I was just working on that earlier today and I don't actually have, it's more in the 60% range um, for for lunch. Um, I didn't finish out that calculation, um, but I can certainly um, send send that information when I finish making that calculation. I expect to do that later today. Our, or to us, um, you know, Brian, uh, Senator Campion, of course, here in this committee. So we spend a little time together every day to kind of keep track of that. Yeah, so you're talking about the number of students eating. What we also have is the number of students who qualify for free and reduced price meals. Um, both, both important metrics. Um, so, um, happy to, to give you both of those. I am going to talk now about this number of students qualifying for free and reduced price meals because that has changed as a result of this CEP rule change. Um, so previously, um, USDA only allowed schools to participate in CEP if at least 40% of their students were directly certified for free and reduced price meals. So direct certification is when we find out that a child is not is eligible for free and reduced price meals from a source other than an application. Um, so it used to be mostly um, SNAP information, Three Squares Vermont, or TANF uh, reach up. Um, information that would directly certify students. And then we had a couple other categories um, like state place foster students, um, homeless, migrant, runaway, and Head Start. Um, so we only look at that. And then um, previously, if, if a school had 40% or more of their students in, that category, in those categories, um, then they could qualify for CEP and use that multiplier. In late September, USDA um, issued their um, final rule lowering that threshold for participation in CEP from 40% to 25%. And so that meant that many, many more of our Vermont schools are eligible to participate in CEP. Normally, that wouldn't have gone into effect until next school year uh, because of the, the normal uh, timeframes for CEP. But we applied for a waiver um, and USDA approved that waiver to do mid-year implementation of CEP using that, um, that rule change. Um, so initially, uh, we started doing that using um, the information from last April, which is what USDA initially told us we needed to do. That's, that's normally, CEP is normally based on April information. And that, of course, was from before we started doing the direct certification through Medicaid pilots. So we did have many more schools who were eligible, but they weren't able to use all of the new information about the Medicaid direct cert students. Um, so using that, um, we had um, about 104 newly eligible, um, I'm sorry, 73 schools who were newly eligible to participate in CEP this fall. So we, we validated those schools, got them all set up, and then, um, in late November, USDA let us know that actually they had the flexibility to allow us to use the new data, the September data from this year, which included all that new direct certification data. So using that information, we went through and um, validated, um, and we're still in the process of validating um, schools using September data, and that allowed a bunch more schools to qualify. Um, so, so far, um, that rule change means that we have 109 newly eligible schools for CEP that have started CEP this year. So 228 of our schools, or about two thirds of our schools, more than two thirds of our schools, um, are using uh, CEP this year. Um, as a result of that mid-year implementation. So that, of course, means that all of those schools are able to use that 1.6 multiplier. Um, and that, combined with the Medicaid direct cert pilot and all that new information, means that our statewide free and reduced percentage is much higher than it was previously. So um, before, um, before COVID, when we were, you know, charging for meals, we had a statewide free and reduced percentage around like 38, 39%. 
And then um, last year when um, we started Universal Meals and, and fewer families returned applications, we had a free and reduced percentage around 34%. So that meant generally that the federal government was paying for about 34% of the meals, um, uh, but then the re remainder were being paid for by state funds. Um, and uh, after this, this big rule change, um, we're actually seeing that our statewide free and reduced percentage um, in December after, after we've validated everybody um, will be above 50%. So that means that more than 50% of the meals will be paid for um, by the federal government completely. Um, so that is amazing news <laughs> um, for- now, uh, do they that, pay, uh, the feds pay more, right? They pay, they, if you have a free meal or a free or reduced meal, it's more than if you just walk in and have to pay for your meal, is that correct? Yeah, so the, the feds actually provide some reimbursement for each type of meal. Um, there is a, um, they basically fully, um, they, they pay the full, um, what's called the full free reimbursement rate for the free meals. For the pay, for the reduced price meals, they pay that amount minus 40 cents for lunch and 30 cents for breakfast, which the state has long paid for out of general fund. Um, and actually, one of the things that we're seeing is that, um, in CEP schools, there's no reduced price category um, because the meals are either free or paid. So because more than two thirds of our schools are now gonna be CEP, that state appropriation um, is gonna be able to be lowered um, for the reduced price meals. Um, there'll be just far fewer reduced price meals. So um, we will come back to you with a, a revision on that um, in future, um, future budget asks. Um, and then um, for the, the paid meals, um, the federal government does subsidize those meals a little bit, um, but that is where um, most of the, the state money is coming from. Um, in, in a pricing program, the family would pay for the remainder of that meal, but under the universal meals law, the, the state pays for that. So um, having a higher free and reduced percentage is only a good thing when it comes to the amount of state money that we're putting towards this program. So we are working on a, a revised estimate. Um, again, we're, we're still validating all those CEP schools um, that we just got the, the information on in December, um, but we're, we're working on a revised estimate for you all of what this year will be um, and estimating that it'll be significantly lower than the, the 26.5 million that we had previously estimated for this year. Um, and um, then going forward next year, um, expecting the same thing because um, all of the schools that are currently participating in CEP this year, um, they will have the option of either continuing on with that cycle at the existing rate that they're currently at, or if their numbers in April are better, um, next year they'll be able to start a new cycle um, with those better numbers. So um, for the next few years, it, it really can, can only get better. The one yeah. thing um, that will um, potentially tick costs up a little bit next year. Um, we can't just take the, the per meal rate from this year and, and multiply it all out, is that USDA does update the per meal reimbursement rates every single year uh, based on some inflation factors. Um, and we're not sure yet what the reimbursement rates will be next year. And the state universal meal supplement is tied to the difference between the federal and the state uh, sorry, the federal free and the federal paid reimbursement rate. Um, and so we saw quite a big jump um, in that difference uh, from last year to this year because of inflation factors. And it's possible we'll see another big increase um, there this year. We're still working on those estimates. Um, and so um, that's the one thing that could make things cost a little bit more than anticipated, but it's still, I don't think will exceed um, exceed our initial estimates or, or even the 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 26.5 that we've got in there as a placeholder for next year. Um, so that's all good news in terms of cost to the state. Um, other good news about all of that is that a higher free and reduced percentage makes more schools eligible for something called area eligibility. So when you take the percentage of students who are directly certified and you multiply it by 1.6, that gets you your free claiming percentage. If that exceeds 50%, um, that school count uh, qualifies as area eligible. 
And that means that during the summertime, um, that school and any locations in the um, attendance area of that school can qualify to operate open meal sites. And that means that any children 18 and under can come and get a meal for free at that, that open summer meal site. Um, so based on all these changes, we're thinking that we're going to have at least 87 schools who are newly eligible to be area eligible next year or next summer. Um, and so that just means many, many more locations in the state that will be able to offer free meals to all children during the summer months. Um, so that's very exciting. A lot of schools want to offer free summer meals in the summer, but they haven't previously qualified as area eligible. So they've had to do things like, you know, only offer the meals to a certain group of kids at a, um, at a summer camp or that kind of thing. And so now they'll be able to be open meal sites. Uh, and that- okay. Just want to quickly, if I could, Rosie, that's a Monday through Friday situation, right? Or are we- Not getting... necessarily. It, it can operate on the weekends. Oh. Um, and we do have some sites that operate on the weekends in the summer. How many, how many schools will qualify? So we'll have 87 additional schools qualifying um, from, from our previous numbers. I don't have the previous numbers offhand, but it's, um, you know, we only have 300 some odd schools. So um, that's obviously a significant increase. Yeah. Um, so um, we'll have uh, increased area eligibility in the summer. Um, and that combines with another um, recent federal change, um, which was actually in place last summer and we did use it last summer, but we'll be able to really um, take advantage of the increased area eligibility and use that more this summer. And that is the USDA change to allow for non-congregate summer meals um, in rural areas. And under USDA's definitions, most of Vermont qualifies as a rural area, um, the exceptions being um, most of Chittenden County and parts of Franklin and Grand Isle counties. Um, so in most of the state, we're able to offer open meal sites where children can come um, eat on site and pick up meals. Um, but then we can also offer these non-congregate meals where children can come and take meals home with them. Um, or we can do um, delivery of meals um, on a, a bus route or um, to mobile meal stops. Um, and that also allows us to offer multiple days worth of meals at one time. Um, so a family could come and pick up, you know, five days worth of meals, um, depending on how that um, meal site is working. Um, and that can be breakfast and lunch. Um, so, um, and then it can also be, it can be a kind of a, um, a unitized meal, so you know your your sandwich, your milk, your fruit, kind of as a meal, or um, it can be what's called bulk meals, where instead of giving you pre-made sandwiches, um, we give you a loaf of bread and a whole bunch of sliced cheese and a, a gallon of milk, um, and the you know a, a bag of apples or or whatever our um, fruit option is, um, it, you know to to meet the the meal pattern. Um, but rather than, than making unitized meals. So those are all options we have now um, that we didn't have previously. And because of the um, increase in area eligibility, there's just a lot more locations in the state where we'll be able to offer that. Now, well, all of that is, is contingent. That, Go ahead. How does that word get out about uh, like the summer meals program? Uh, is, do you work with uh, Anar and... How, how does that word get out to the school districts and the hot lunch programs? Yeah, um, well, we certainly work with Hunger Free Vermont on that. Um, they they keep um, a really nice uh, part of their website um, that shows that information. We also share that information with USDA, and they put that into a national mapping website called the Meal Finder. Um, so families can go to that address and or that that website and type in their address and find the closest summer meal sites. Um, and those could be, you know, in New Hampshire or New York, you know, um, folks on, on border counties can cross um, into to other states. Um, the summer meals program is, is really wonderfully flexible, um, where at open meal sites, it's any kid 18 and under, um, and it doesn't really matter where you live to access those sites. Um, so we use the meal finder. Um, we give the information to 211, so families can call 211. And then um, at the end of the school year, schools are also required to share out the information about um, 
meal sites that they know about in their area, or at the very least, um, share out the um, USDA meal finder information for families. And then we also do things like, you know, there's posters and signage um, that sites um, will put up in their communities to direct families. Um, but certainly, you know, we want you all to know about it. Um, if you're hearing from constituents over the summer months who are having difficulty with food, um, the summer meal sites are a great, um, a great place for kids to access food during the summer. Um, now, the, the other piece on that, um, <laughs> that that we might need your help with is that in order to operate these summer meal sites, we need community partners. Um, so all of these sites are now going to be eligible to operate um, open summer meal sites, but that's, that's only good if someone locally decides, yeah, we're going to go ahead and operate a site. And so often that's a school district. Um, they're usually the best set up already. Um, they're already set up with us to um, receive those funds and apply um, more streamlined, more, more easily. Um, and they obviously already have facilities and staff, um, but it also can be community partners. Um, so the summer meal sites can be operated by nonprofit organizations, by local governments. Um, we like to see sites anywhere that kids congregate in the summer. Um, so libraries, pools, you know, rec departments, um, all of those are great places to operate um, open summer meal sites. So if you're hearing from folks in your community who want to know what they can do, um, please send them our way. Um, we would really like to talk to local community partners about um, opening up additional meal sites in their communities, um, especially because we have this ability now with these additional area eligible sites. That's good. That's good. That's great. Yeah. Um, the other piece of area eligibility is that um, that also allows us all those um, additional schools that are now area eligible are also allowed to offer um, uh, free free meals to all uh, or free after school snacks um, to all students through the after school snack program. Um, or um, they can also participate in the um, at risk after school meals program through the child and adult care food program um, to offer um, after school suppers. Um, so that is another um, area for growth um, in our state now. Um, we have all these additional locations that are eligible. So um, we will be you know, reaching out to all the schools um, that are now newly eligible and asking if they're interested in starting these programs. But um, if you, especially if you have an existing after school activity program, um, this is a really good, um, a good program to, to take advantage of. So, you know, the kids are there after school doing activities, but then they can also get a snack or potentially a supper um, as um, if, if that program works in combination with the child nutrition programs. So that's something that we're hoping to see grow um, over the next year as well, um, because we have this additional eligibility. Um, so that is uh, kind of the, the overview of, of all those new rule changes and how they're impacting things. Um, I did want to talk to you about um, just a little bit of additional, um, some changes we're seeing as a result of the universal meals law. Um, you did have a bunch of discussion last year about how to handle independent schools. Um, we came back to you looking for some clarity on that. Um, and you decided specifically that for so, so the pilot year law um, said that independent schools, um, you would only uh, provide the universal meal supplement if they offered free meals to all students and you would only provide the supplement for um, children who are publicly tuitioned. Um, and we asked you last year for clarity on how you wanted us to handle independent schools that were sites under public school school food authorities. Um, and we have a number of these around the state where, you know, there's a small independent school and the, the public school district in their area kind of takes that site under their wing and offers the school meals program at that site um, and takes responsibility for it. And that is allowed um, in the federal programs. And it's something that we encourage because it's just more efficient administratively. Um, and so um, you clarified for us that we should treat those independent schools exactly the same as independent schools who are their own school food authority. And so um, we had two independent schools that had previously been operating under public school school food authorities. Um, St. Michael's School in Brattleboro had been operating under Wind of Northeast Supervisory Union. 
and um, Christ the King in Rutland had been operating under Rutland City School District. And after that change, um, the meals at those schools um, would only be reimbursed for the, the publicly tuition students. Um, and so very few of those school of those meals would be reimbursed um, with the state funds. And so as a result of that, those schools have since left the program. Um, they, they're no longer part of those public school, school food authorities. Our yeah. understanding was that they intended to come on as their own school food authority. Um, they've started to work through the paperwork on that, but they haven't finished it. And so at this point in the year, they're not participating in the programs at all. Um, so it's obviously a concern for us whenever we lose anybody participating in the program um, and just wanted to flag that for you all that um, that was something that happened as a result of that clarification. Yeah. Um, well, I, Ryan has a thanks, Mr. Chair. And thanks for this, uh, Rosie. So uh, can you loop back to those schools or somebody and just touch base with them? I, I know you expressed gen, you know, concern that they, they dropped out of the program and they may be working on a different application. Is there a way to loop back and see if they need help? Yeah, we, we have. We, oh. we definitely have, have reached out a number of times and said, you know, do you need help? Are you working on it? You know, Thank you. Um, I'm not and surprised it, that you've done that. Thank you very much. It, it seems to be a little bit of a, a staffing capacity issue. You know, previously okay. the public school, school food authorities conducted all the administration of the program. Um, okay. And there's not, I think they're they're probably struggling a little bit with having the administrative capacity to to take this on on their own, um, which is not particularly surprising. Um, it, it's a lot um, to administer as a, a single building. Um, so, uh, but we are continuing to reach out. Um, we've been trying to en encourage um, the, the Catholic schools in general to group together as one school food authority, um, which we think would be more um, administratively efficient um, and is certainly allowable under the programs. Um, yeah. And I think they may intend to go there in the future, but it's just been kind of slow to, to get that transition going. Those, those children get hungry just like all children. So it would be good to get those that straightened out so they can provide meals, that's for sure. And that's really a policy decision on your end. You know, you you made the policy decision last year that you only wanted to provide that supplement for the publicly tuitioned students. Mm -hmm. um, the the religious schools in general have fewer publicly tuitioned students than other um, independent schools. So, for example, conversation. Yeah, Candy is taking the blame for messing it up. <laughs> so we'll straighten him out. Other other independent schools, for example, the academies are all participating, and they have lots of publicly tuitioned students, um, and so it is much more efficient for them. They have some students who aren't publicly tuitioned, but in general, those are um, students who are, are paying tuition, uh, or you know, able to pay tuition, um, and so they're able to incorporate the, the meal charge into that tuition charge. Um, and I will say that um, in general, we have had some interest from other independent schools um, in uh, joining the program. Um, so folks who have more publicly tuition students um, are now interested in this program. So it's not, um, oh, I just lost my video here. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I don't know where my video went, but um, I can keep talking here. Um, it's not that um you could start it again my apologies that's okay um so it it's not that this is um something that is universally true for independent schools it just depends on how many publicly tuition students they have um and again there there has been some interest from um independent schools that weren't previously participating in the program in starting because of this um I think the last thing I would just tell you um, is that um, I uh, also um, worked on, uh, as part of the state's emergency response to the flooding this summer, um, as part of the State Emergency Operations Center um, on uh, mass feeding efforts and making sure that folks who were impacted by the flooding um, had access to meals, especially because, you know, folks who were displaced from their homes and um, folks who had their kitchens damaged um, or, you know, grocery store access disrupted. 
And um, that was a, a very stressful couple months trying to make sure that um, we had resources available for folks. And I really breathed a sigh of relief once school started in the fall because I knew that that was one group of folks that we no longer needed to worry as much about. Um, that, that kids had access to two, maybe three meals a day, but at least two meals a day um, at their schools. Um, and that, you know, we, we still needed to do a lot of work to ensure um, that their families had places to access the other meals. Um, but that was kind of a, a surprising um, consequence of this um, that I just wanted to flag for you all um, that just, it was an ad additional safety net um, that I didn't didn't quite realize um, we had an, until school started and, and we were able to implement that. So that's what I had uh, as far as an update for you about um, how the universal meals policy is going. Um, what other questions do you have on that? Yeah, a uh, question from oh, Rachel. No, that was terrific, yeah. Rosie. It even sounded better the second time. <laughs> I've had <laughs> practice. No, 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 it's not you. It's me. Now, we'll have great. you back again next week so you can run us off. The <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, I did want to flag for you as well. Um, we did. Um, we did submit the annual local foods incentive report to you all um, a week or two ago. Um, and that is our annual report on how the local foods incentive grant um, that was really uh, came out of this committee, um, how that's going and what schools have gotten funds for that. Um, I wasn't planning to talk a lot about that today, but I did want to just flag it for you all. It's a very thorough report. There's some suggestions in there for things that you might do um, to to make schools more successful in their local purchasing. So definitely take a look at that if you haven't seen it. Yeah. Um, any questions from committee members? Terrific. Well, Rosie, um, you know, we, we did our work over here, but you were the ones that, that implemented it and at the agency and, and um, you know, you should be congratulated on taking a mess of stuff from us and making it all work um, because uh, you know it and it it goes to show if to if you work together uh in a good uh way you can you can really do good things for for the people so uh thanks a lot for all your hard work and uh we certainly uh appreciate it of course, thank you. Thank you, Rosie. So, Anar, would you like to comment on how your perspective of the school meals program? Because you've been dogging this for years. <laughs> finally, very true. Finally, got as, us to as do have some. you, Senator. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, oh. Thank you all for having me. I'm Anora Horton, and I'm the executive director of Hunger Free Vermont and the resident of Williston, Vermont. Oh, yeah. um, and thank you for having me here to um, join Rosie and talking about the success of Act 64, Vermont's Permanent Universal School Meals Program, uh, which this committee um, has also been dogging for many, many years, um, right along with me. So. Um, this success is really uh, your success, and um, on behalf of all the families in Vermont, um, I thank you for that. Um, so you heard from Rosie the, the data, the numbers, so I'm not going to go over that again. I would like to say um, also that the Agency of Education, R Rosie's team, uh, the Child Nutrition Programs Department there, has done an extraordinary job of um, thinking through what needed to be in Act 64 and working with all of you to make sure that those key components were in there. Um, Rosie mentioned this, but I don't think she quite blew her own horn enough and the agency's own horn enough. Uh, Vermont's implementation of permanent universal school meals is 
the best implementation, our law is the best law of any of the ones that have been passed, any of the eight that have been passed nationally. And it's because of the care and thought and collaboration that went into it. And uh, the Agency of Education has done a phenomenal job of implementing. You aren't nationally. saying that just because you're from Vermont. <laughs> um, no, it's really true. Good. <laughs> and I'm proud to be from Vermont, especially <laughs> when talking about Act 64. Um, so, um, so I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to give you any more numbers. Uh, what I would like to do instead is um, share with you uh, the experiences of the people on the ground in our schools who are implementing this, this uh, Universal School Meals Program. Um, every day with the students. Uh, so I asked uh, some folks who, some of whom came and testified before you all uh, last year um, uh, from our school nutrition programs um, and our education programs to share with me some words that they would like you to, to hear. And that is what I'm going to um, share with you as my testimony. Um, so I hope that as you listen to these words, that you are hearing them as a profound expression of gratitude to this committee for all of your hard work over three sessions, plus a whole lot of other stuff before that, uh, to pass this game-changing law for students, families, and schools. Universal Meals in Vermont has helped so many families. This program has not only improved access to nutrition for children, but also help to ensure that families can allocate funds to other important expenses, such as housing and healthcare. Universal School Meals has created a more inclusive and supportive environment where children feel accepted and can focus on their education without worrying about where their next meal will come from. By giving our students access to healthy and satisfying breakfast and lunch options, we can set them up for success in the classroom. My family has certainly benefited from the program and I know many folks in our community feel the same way. And that is from Kelly White, a site coordinator at Essex Westford School District. Uh, from Stephanie Gates, uh, the Food Service Director for Bennington Rutland Supervisory Union, the students' expressions of gratitude serve as validation for the effort invested in enacting universal school meals into legislation. Universal school meals has promoted inclusivity among students, alleviated financial worries about school meals for families, and delivered substantial advantages to our community. From Carol Kent, the Food Services Director for Lamoille North Supervisory Union, Universal School Meals has changed the culture of school meals at Lamoille North SU. In our middle and high school, meal times are far less stressful for students. They come through our lines with healthy, delicious food choices. They interact with our cashiers with friendliness, lively banter, and gratitude where in the past there had been some trepidation, fear, and shame. My 40-year-old daughter was at a gathering with other moms, and the talk was all about how great it was that they do not have to rush their kids in the morning to get breakfast into them, knowing that they can have breakfast with their friends at school. For families, it has relieved some stress from the morning rush. It is a joy every day to see children just enjoying mealtimes together. Regardless of income levels, they all have the same choices. And Scott Fay, Food Services Director for Essex Westford. With Vermont's Universal School Meals Program, schools are able to focus on producing quality meals and providing excellent service to students. Cash collection and the process of collecting on bad debt associated with paid meal programs has historically put wedges between schools and families in need of support. With Universal School Meals, we don't create barriers between families in need and schools. We build bridges. And Harley Sterling, Nutrition Director for Wyndham Northeast Supervisory Union, Universal School Meals has helped make our cafeterias a place where students feel safe and welcome. They come to school every day knowing their basic needs will be taken care of. For our younger students, they live in a world that has never shamed and stigmatized them for not having much money. Some of the most sincere gratitude comes from our teachers and staff who see the sea change in school culture. As a border community, many of our teachers live in New Hampshire and send their children to schools without universal school meals. For them, the contrast could not be more stark. Not only is universal school meals money back in the pockets of Vermont working families who no longer have to pack meals 
or worry about lunch money. Their kids get to go to schools where meals are enjoyed by everyone who wants them stress-free. Oh, and yeah, I, I don't know about the other committee members we have chatted about, but I attend quite a few meetings in off session, and I don't think I've been to one meeting in the last year or two that somebody somewhere sometime during that meeting has mentioned how supportive uh, they are of what we did in regards to universal needs. Uh, I haven't had one person say anything bad about it either, which is, you know, the ordinary conversation is, you know, what are you crazy doing in Mount Philippe? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't get that really too often. Um, but uh, you know, it was it was a good piece of legislation, and you know, with the help of you folks and the agency, uh, we we all worked together very well, and uh, we got good votes for it here in the legislature, and uh, no, it. it gone very well in, in those numbers that we got this morning from Rosie. Um, yeah, I, I would expect, I mean, Washington is Washington, but it won't be too many years, but they'll just pay the bill. Uh, you know, they'll have a free meals program nationwide. And, and uh, you know, I've always said, if you take care of your children and and your elders, uh, you know, the middle will be fine. And, uh, so it's it's worked good. Uh, anything else, Anora? Well, I, I would also just like to underscore the incredible opportunity that the design of Act 64 is now going to provide to expand free summer and after school yeah. meals. Yeah. So, um, and have a free Vermont, um, we maintain that um, you know, uh, updated locations of every single summer meal site in the state on our on our website, as Rosie said. But we also will be actively um, we raise private funding to do paid advertising to let people know um, about summer meal sites. Uh, we're going to be doing a really big push in collaboration with the agency of education right. this summer and with the expanded after school uh, programming funding that is now available. Um, that is also going to bring many more children into after school and summer programming, which is very, very important. But we have to make sure that while those kids are in that programming, they are being well fed. And so um, this expanded opportunity to add um, federally paid for um, after school and summer meals is really a critical piece to the success of making sure that more kids have access to after school and summer programming. Mm -hmm. So we're working closely with Vermont After School as well on making sure that those those two things, meals and programming, is are going to go together. Uh, and we have so much more opportunity now um, yeah. to make that happen. Well, the other the other part of this whole discussion is, uh, you know, local foods and getting those into the schools and, um, yeah, right. you know, the farm to plate and the farm to school uh, uh, issues. We we haven't gotten a report yet in regards to how that's helping our, our farmers uh, have an outlet uh, for their food to give to our children and, um, and that's very important. Uh, you know, we have fresh, wholesome food grown right here at home that hasn't had to sit in a cooler for months in order to light across country on a truck or a train to go. So that that's the other important side of of the, all this discussion. Yes, absolutely. And um, you know, I mean, when when this committee drafted. Uh, kind of put together that first bill 
it was universal school meals, the local food purchasing incentive, and yeah. increased funding for the Farm to School and Early Childhood Grants Program. And even though the bill got split up and all of those, those three things travel differently, this legislature passed all three of those and, and funded all three of those components. And our vision was always farm fresh school meals for all, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and we, have, we have the pieces in place to make that happen. And I think the local food purchasing incentive report is hopeful and identifies also, you know, I mean, we've had the pandemic, the flooding, oh. there have been some real challenges yeah. to um, our local food producers, uh, but that, but those components are going to keep working together, I believe, over time to um, really grow um, the ability of schools to buy and go to this more local food. And, um, you know, just a couple of days ago, I was in here with some other folks um, presenting the Vermont uh, Food Security Roadmap to you all. And, you know, this legislation, Act 64, I mean, this is exactly the kind of, um, of legislation that we're talking about that is going to make it possible for us to have food security by 2035 and not just any kind of food security but homegrown, Vermont-grown food security yeah. uh, with an agricultural system that's climate resilient and where there are local outlets for farmers to sell their produce. And schools are our <clears throat> biggest restaurants in every one of our towns. So we yeah. should never forget that. Uh, uh, thanks, Senator. Uh, yeah, that's a great point. You know, we talk about impacts on, you know, trying to play our role to reduce carbon, you know, if you've got truck going a mile rather than 100 miles to bring fresh fruits or vegetables or a thousand or whatever, that's, that's and a then big change. Half and then go, back in, right, right, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I love that part of the bill. Everything but, works to the advantage of things that we've been working on for years. Yeah, uh, it is a very good coming together. You know, the roads stay better if you have less it's a good track there. So, no, it's been, uh, it's been a long How many years have you been on this? 10 years? Been yeah. a decade. Wow, been a long that's incredible. Time. Yeah, but that's incredible. I think, I think when that happens, you appreciate it more at the end. You know, it's easy to ram a bill through. Or I've always found it fairly easy to ram a bill through. But this thing, I mean, we've worked on it and worked on it, and uh, it, uh, you know, you really appreciate the uh, accomplishment more uh, because it's been a long haul. And, uh, but, you know, if you can feed these children, and, and you know, these private schools, there's only a hand, and why shouldn't those little kids eat right along with the rest of the kids? And we'll we'll try to get that straightened out. Uh, uh, you know, some people get all torqued up. Oh, well, it's a private school, and they're paying to send their kids to have the old board to feed them. You know, well, I don't care if they can afford or not. Those those people are paying their taxes right along with everyone else, and those children uh, should uh, be able to have free meals with the rest of the children. We'll get that fixed right, Brian. Well, we're, well, you've got that seat down the hall, which always helps. Well, Richie's right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, two out of seven is a bad, a, a bad place to start. <laughs> yeah. So, any other comments? Or, uh, uh, well, done. well done. Well done. Well, yeah, you, you guys make a good team. Well, well done, all of you. So, thank you so much. Thank you. So, Holly, look at that clock. I can't believe we're on time. Uh, it's unusual. Uh, so, we have a group of people with us from uh, 
the Northeast Kingdom Collaborative this morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they're going to be with us for oh, a half hour or so, I hope. And uh, if we squeeze our break. And uh, it, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, each of you uh, to our our meeting this morning. This is uh, the Senate Agricultural Committee. And uh, some of you have been listening to probably to what what we heard this morning. And uh, so we'll, I don't know if you heard, got here early enough to get the introductions, but we'll quickly introduce ourselves and then we'll have you folks introduce yourself and we'll see what you've got for questions uh, and concerns, and we'll go from there. Uh, so it's great to have you with us, uh, Brian. Yep. Brian Collin, we're representing the Rutland District. Irene Renner, Chittenden North, which includes Fairfax. Brian Campion, Bennington District. Rich Westman, the Loyal District. And I'm uh, Bobby Starr, representing uh, Orleans County, and in four towns in uh, Caledonia County. So welcome, and if you folks would like to introduce yourselves, uh, we'll uh, get started. Sure. I'm Jenna O'Farrell, I'm the Executive Director of Northeast Kingdom Community Action. Morning. Hi. Whoops. I'm Cheryl McFetty. I'm the principal in Lunenburg School. Yeah. I'm Catherine Cusack, the Executive Director of Green Mountain Farm to School, based out in Newport. I'm Tanika Stewart. I'm the Child Nutrition Director for Caledonia Central Supervisory Union. Well, welcome, folks. And I don't know if, if uh, any order, we don't have any order down here, so there isn't any official order for you folks to <laughs> Uh, jump in, but if one of you wants to lead off, uh, we'd be glad to uh, hear from you. I can start yeah. if that's okay with the, the sure. team here. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Senator Starr, for inviting us this morning um, and all the work that the committee has done. It's amazing. I'm, as I said, Jenna O'Farrell. I live in St. Johnsbury, and for five and a half years, I've been the executive director of Northeast Kingdom Community Action, which serves Caledonia, Orleans, and Essex County. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk about Vermont School Meals. And um, I don't know how much, I'm sure you know about community action in all of your counties. In the Northeast Kingdom, we are the leading organization addressing poverty through education, community collaborations, and essential services our services include food insecurity, financial well-being, homelessness, warmth, early education, restorative justice, community reintegration, and employment. Throughout the pandemic and local disasters, such as the July flooding, we increased critical support and services to the most vulnerable Vermonters. In the Northeast Kingdom, we operate four emergency food pantries, Newport, Canaan, Island Pond, and St. Johnsbury, two mobile units that are out in the most rural areas delivering food, and we partner with a rural food delivery program in Orleans County. On a community level, we provide supplemental food assistance and support for Monters and applying for three scores benefits. In our eight Head Start locations that are located throughout the Northeast Kingdom and some of the most rural communities, we always have provided meals and snacks at no cost to our families. Fortunately, NECA is not the only organization providing food assistance and the need has grown exponentially over the past four years for all of our families, not just those living at or below the federal poverty level. We serve many families seeking food assistance for the first time and families that do not qualify for any other benefits because their income exceeds their eligibility criteria and they still cannot afford to feed their children. A major partner in addressing childhood hunger are our schools where all children receive free, free school meals. I'm sure no one disagrees that food is a human right and our children deserve to be nourished. Providing free meals to our youngest Vermonters is not just the right thing to do, it's an upstream investment in our future. I cannot imagine the impact on our children and families if free meals were not available at schools. Um, and I'm sure that you all know this data, but it's, it is fascinating to, to think about the average cost of providing lunch and breakfast for a child in, Ver in Vermont would be $4.58 a day. And if you think about a family having two elementary grade students annually, that would have a savings or um, disposable or discretionary income for them 
at about $1,600. Free school meals afford families the opportunity to allocate these financial resources differently. Money that families previously spent on feeding their children breakfast and lunch are now available to spend and improve the quality of their, their life and the quality of the food that they can provide, pay debt, manage household expenses, afford childcare, own and drive vehicles. Their pot, the way they can invest the money is endless. In Canaan, Vermont, which is one of our most rural communities in the corner of the Northeast Kingdom, we assisted NECA 37 households in that area. Our food shelf um, turned over 28,000 pounds of food last year with approximately 120 individuals out of a population of 340. Essex County has unique challenges. The NEK Choice District was formed in 2018, and there's currently one high school, four elementary schools in a region that's 664 square miles. Many children are transported a significant distance to their schools, and Essex County is a food desert with what, no major grocer in the entire county. Free school meals become integral to rural areas with unique challenges. Anecdotally, and Anor touched on this as well, I think there's a tremendous benefit of free meals that's not easily quantified, and it's the quality of parent-child relationships. If you've ever parented or had the responsibility of shopping, buying, organizing, and preparing school meals for your children, it's a daunting task that can be riddled with tension and strife. Without the daily struggle, parental stress is decreased. Additionally, um, in Vermont, we have a law, 16 VSA, 136 that mandates physical education in our schools because we value physical education. But oh, we also know that physical education alone doesn't prove healthy outcomes for children. So coupled with providing healthy, balanced, free meals, children have a better um, chance of having stronger health outcomes. Finally, I don't think anybody disagrees with the philosophy of feeding children. And I'm proud of our commitment to ending childhood hunger in Vermont and hopeful that we can sustain these efforts into the future. And thank you for your time this morning. <laughs> well, thank thank you very much. Uh, great testimony. And uh, it's hard to believe there's not one major food store in Essex County. Uh, you know, that, uh, that's something. Um, so who would like any questions? Or, you no, know, it's very interesting. No. Uh, yeah. Uh, who would like to go next? Any particular time schedule for anybody? Uh, I can go next before I have any issues in my building. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, good morning and welcome. Thank you. Um, again, I'm Cheryl McVetty. I'm the principal at Lunenburg School. This is my eighth year as principal here, and um, I totally appreciate the universal meals. We are high poverty, um, a lot of food insecurities. Um, and we also receive 160 backpacks per month from the Vermont Food ba Bank. And we have our students who ask for them weekly. So they're they're needed. Um, that number has been restricted to only enrolled students. It used to be we could also hand them out if they had younger siblings at home. Um, so that number has been capped. And, you know, for other things that we've tried to build within the Lunenburg community five years ago, using um, some funds from the Vermont Principals Grant that I got, we established a food shelf um, at the town clerk's office. And that continues to be maintained and utilized by community members. So that's really important. So my testimony is short and sweet. Um, I jumped onto this yesterday. I said, okay, I'll do this. So uh, it's my first time and I appreciate the work everybody has done. And these meals are are certainly vital to our school. And I appreciate all the work everyone's done. And thank you. Uh, and thanks uh, for your comments. Uh, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on the, is it the backpack program that got cut or something? Yeah. Um, well, I don't know, cut or restricted. We we could use more than 160 per month. Um, and my admin assistant does the work to order all of these. And he he said that um, it's restricted now that it's, it can only be for our enrolled students. You know, if we have some younger students, um, younger children at home, we can't send them home, the extra ones with them. It's only for the enrolled students that we have. Yeah, thanks. Well, we uh, we can certainly uh, check that situation now, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Cheryl, how many students are in K through five in Lunenburg? 
We have just under 60 now. Okay. And you saw, and I, we've heard great testimony this morning, a difference for real between what used to be, you know, breakfast and lunch and what it is there now. Yes, definitely. Definitely. And um, the, the snack program, we have snacks for the kids and they're very healthy, a lot of fruit and vegetables and yeah, very important in our after school uh, program also gets the meals as well. That's great to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other? No. Um, so we'll move on to. Um... I can go. Yeah. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for taking the time to, to hear from us. I'm Catherine Cusack, the executive director at Green Mountain Farm School in Newport, and I, you know, like to to focus my moments here focusing on the local food purchasing incentive. Um, certainly high accolades for the universal school meals, and have seen you know a ripple effect of that. Um, just to give you a brief background, our organization um, owns and operates a food hub, a aggregation and distribution food hub. Our mission is centered around healthy food access, local food access. Um, in addition, we do some farm to school education and some other things that I'm happy to talk to you about another time. But I really think the relevant um, <clears throat> program that we operate is our farm direct food hub and the effects we've or the benefits we've seen and are experiencing firsthand with the local with universal school meals which is just expanding school budgets and allowing them to purchase local food um, from us we're currently serving 44 NEK schools um, 14 of those were first time purchasers in 2023 um, wow. a lot to do with the local purchasing incentive and then the local food um incentive grant that is being funneled through the agency of ag um, um, using federal dollars. Overall, we serve 147 schools throughout Vermont. Um, in 2023, those schools purchased $179,000 worth of local food from us. That's 80% of that is returned directly to the farmer. Ms. Um, Kuzak, do you mind repeating that, that dollar amount? Hundred and seventy nine thousand. Right, that's good. That is good. And that's just our little food hub. Yeah, <laughs> um, we we're that. that's great. Yeah, that's great. And you know, just I had my staff go back a few years. You know, we're building back up to uh, pre pandemic levels. In twenty twenty one, that number was ninety thousand, which was like right in the middle of the pandemic. And so mm -hmm. we've doubled that that volume in the last two years um, to schools, uh, you know, and where a lot of that money is supporting NEK farms, um, but we're obviously not sourcing solely from the NEK, um, the NEK farms that we are sourcing from, you know, are a lot of dairy, um, a meat producer and uh, produce. So schools are ordering, you know, the full plate of food from our food hub. And it's, I mean, it's just fantastic. And that local purchasing incentive is increased their buying power. Um, we have had feedback about qualifying for that local purchasing incentive. And some of our smaller rural schools are challenged with that 15% threshold when they apply. I'm not sure how much in the nitty gritty you're familiar with, but, um, that schools need to do to become eligible for the local purchasing incentive. Um, there's some limitations around schools, you know, needing to unify and apply, apply as a school district um, that presents challenges for them when they're spread out and they don't have like one point person doing that work. And so one school within a supervisory union may be meeting that threshold and maybe, you know, raring to go and, and wanting to take advantage. But because there needs to be a unified supervisory wide application that is preventing um, some barriers there. So I don't know if if there's some, you know, other considerations for how people or how schools are applying for that local purchasing incentive or how they're meeting that threshold in order to apply. Um, we're excited about the local food 
we call it LFS and I am, it is escaping me what that LFS stands for. It's local, local food, something, um, through the agency of ag, um, they applied and received money from the USDA and our food hub is one of the food hubs that's helping to, you know, funnel that money kind of into local food back to the schools. And the great thing about that is that they're able to use the purchases with LFS to qualify for the LPI, the, the local purchasing incentive. And so we're slated to finish the LFS program at the end of calendar year of 2024. And um, so we're, we're excited to you know, yeah. use that data to help more schools qualify for the local purchasing incentive. Um, but I am hearing, like I said, some challenges around meeting that threshold and the whole application process. Um, I think right currently it's a 15 schools need to show that they're using 15% of their budget to qualify. You know, that I'd advocate for 10% for some of our smaller schools. Um, they're really working hard at it. And, you know, a little bit, that little bit of latitude um, would go a long way, I think. Um, yeah, I think I think the numbers speak for themselves, you know, that the economic, the multiplier effect, the I heard a comment around, you know, climate resiliency and reducing food miles and then just the health um, of our the students that we're serving. The food tastes better. There's less food waste. Um, it, it, it's really wonderful that there are a lot of schools that, you know, they want to serve more local food. I, I think that um, it, it's how we can break down the, the barriers for them to access it. And, and that's what our food hub and, and several other smaller food hubs across the state have been working on. So I appreciate your support. The Universal School Meals is great. The local purchasing incentive is great. We see benefits with the Farm to School and Early Childhood Education Grants. Um, we partner with NECA and, and they purchase food from our food hub to distribute in their food shelves. And that's been a great relationship. Um, we do also source local food for backpack programs and holiday meal baskets. And so far, we've done that fundraising on our own to to supplement those backpacks. Um, I, I don't know, you know, if there's thought been given to providing some state funding <laughs> or, you know, those out of school time meals, um, which several people have spoken to the benefits of. Uh, yeah, Brian, you had a, uh, thanks Mr. Chair. Uh, it, yeah, I think at some point, um, it'd be great if I might pop up and see your hub i would it would be great to see it it sounds like it's working really well maybe on a monday i'll be in touch and try to zip up there yep that that would be great our the food is actually um, stored and distributed out of hardwick oh it is we okay have... that's actually even easier for me yeah. great thank you very much thank you yeah. yeah thank you thank you for your time so um and uh um we have heard from you gotta go next. You're the only one left standing. <laughs> All right. Um, my name is uh, Tanika, and I am the food service director for Caledonia Central Supervisory Union. We're seven schools in the Northeast Kingdom area, ranging from 60 students at a school to 350 at um, Twinfield, and about the same at Danville. So. Um, we range in size pretty significantly um, and also geographically. Um, but, and most of what I want to do is just kind of reiterate a lot of the things that have already been said, but um, just having been the food service director for the last three years, I've really um, sort of did a lot of the struggling through the COVID stuff and have been able to see the impact of universal school meals. Um, it's It's been really profound. Um, and I, I think most of all, as a result of serving more children, regardless of their eligibility status, we've been able to turn our attention away from sort of the business part of meal service and focus back on improving the quality and the variety of our food and increasing our local procurement and building those relationships with our farmers. Um, 
it's it's given us the time to be able to go back to the basics of being able to do those things again. And I think that that impact has been profound. Um, hearing, just reiterating, reiterating everything that Rosie had said, just the, the way that these programs are starting to kind of unfold. And um, just with the direct certification through the Medicaid pilot, and the um, the USDA federal rule change in regards to community el eligibility. I can speak to the fact that we are a supervisory union that has um, has been affected in the posit in a very positive way this year as a result of both of those changes. Um, our numbers have skyrocketed in terms of um, free students who are now eligible because of that direct certification through Medicaid times that 1.6 multiplier. We're now, we went from being a supervisory union that had a free and reduced eligibility status of somewhere hovering around 30% um, to now as a supervisory union over 50%. Um, so that puts a lot of money, um, you know, a lot of our reimbursement back into the federal scope and um, away from the costs on state. Um, so I think that we're a great example of the positive benefits of these programs actually working. And a lot of our sites are now actually going to be area eligible schools. Um, and so we're, I've already started working with libraries um, in our community who are really, really engaged and looking forward to being able to make um, our sites open sites this summer um, to be able to provide kids with meals. Because I know that as a food service director and as a mom, at the end of the year, um, I always get a pit in my stomach, um, sending kids home, not knowing exactly where they're gonna get their food, whether it's like what the quality of that food is gonna be like, um, and knowing that we now have this um, new resource for our area is um, is really profound. So thank you for everything that you've done to make this possible um, and make our job um, much more meaningful. Yeah, um, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Shanka. Um, maybe a, a quick question for Jenna. Have, have you noticed uh, any drop in in uh, food uh, hunger uh, since we started the universal meal program from citizens up in the kingdom? No, I don't. I think that that's more indicative of um, economic pressures for families and our, our largest demographic actually, and most of our um, food shelves are we have an aging population. So we, we see a lot of people over um, 55. Yeah, older, well. they're both. Yeah, well, <laughs> food costs a lot of money and if they're on social security, um, it uh, doesn't go quite as far as it used to, that's for sure. Um, right. Any other uh, questions from any of you in regards to Anything else that we're attempting to do or should be doing that we you don't hear about uh, except for on the nose? Uh, yeah, there's um, <clears throat> we're in our what, fourth week. Third, the end of the third. End of our third week, and um, you know we we've got a, <clears throat> a quite a few. Um, Bills coming in. Uh, we've been hearing from the different uh, parts of the ag agency and and things. Uh, and the universal meals program is uh, an issue that actually it was started from trying to get uh, the farm to school stuff, uh, local foods into the hot lunch and and. Uh, we kept uh, wondering how we were going to do that with what school meals was paying. And I don't know, we came up with the idea, well, if we had universal meals and had everybody that could qualify through the federal program, we'd have more money 
coming into our meals program, so they would have more money to be able to buy local, fresh, wholesome foods. And uh, and as some of you heard this morning, uh, that's all going very well. And we had uh, we've had many obstacles to to go over and climb over, uh, but. Uh, we did get it done, and and uh, it it uh, really this morning those numbers were quite impressive, and and uh, the the good parts that are uh, that they're coming out of that, saving people money, and and you folks uh, commented in regards. Well, it leaves them a little bit more money. Uh, to go to the local grocery store with or to pay their rent or health payment with them. So hopefully it's made life a little bit better for our citizens. And that's what government's supposed to do, I think. <laughs> uh, but anyways, um, have you got anything else from any of you? If, if not, uh, I don't, I don't know what time your uh, collaborative uh, meeting is getting done, uh, but I think it's around 10.30, I think. And, well, it's just about 10.30. So uh, thanks a lot for being with us this morning and uh, participating. We certainly appreciate uh, your time and, and energy. And, of course, any time that you have Thing you'd like to get hold of us about, uh, feel free to call anytime. And um, my phone's usually busy, but keep trying and you know catch up at home even. So thank thanks again. Uh, and enjoy your morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going out live now, so the other committee can come yeah. in. Thank you. Okay.